<laughs> so this week we are discussing the taking the Indian burial ground concept to a whole new level. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself and what fear creates. Creator of the Conehead icon, pregnant seven-year-olds bearing a god in their womb, dog masterminds, an aesthetic that would make a sadist proud. Forget about it. Ed's dead and ready, a literal form of projecting, split personalities, and even more so, souls, daddy issues, mommy issues, issues with being burned alive by your mom, spinoffs, movies, and trying to piece together the story, oh my, games itself. This week, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Silent Hills, Fog, slash Otherworld. Inside note, a while back in my What Sets Left 4 Dead Apart From Other Zombie Games video, I incorrectly labeled Silent Hill as one of these said zombie titles. I'd never played it in the past, so apologies, we all make mistakes. Also, keep in mind, we will be going over the lore leading up to the dangerous scenario that this game creates to give context to its origins and demonic presences. So, way back sometime before the 16th century, Native Americans had conducted rituals in a sacred place known as the Place of Silent Spirits. Not in the vein of deceased loved ones, but a strange spiritual energy emanating from this land. A deity reminiscent of a raven was believed by numerous tribes to have the ability to rule over memory itself. During the North American colonization period, colonials came to this place to drive out the Native Americans through means of brute force and genocide. Before becoming a township with a proper name, the Salem Witch Trials were in full swing in this budding nation. Certain colonizers had learned of the raven revered by the Native tribes and soon sought to worship it in a vein close to Christian faith systems, rather than living in tandem with it like the Native Americans. A budding organization's follower named Jennifer Carroll would be discovered bowing to this hedonistic methods and was promptly burned at the stake by fearful Christians. Jennifer would be revered as a saint by this organization that would one day be called the Order. Those of this new faith would flee to create a nearby township of Shepherd's Glen with blackjack and hookers. You know what? Forget the blackjack and hookers. All you need is a contract to devout faith to a new god and to always obey it. Less than a decade later, the earlier settlement is stricken with a new and strange plague that sweeps the town before the USA was even established as its own country. It wasn't until 1810 that people returned to this long abandoned sacred place to build it up as a penal colony, a place to exile prisoners far away from conventional society and was named Silent Hill by newcomers, with its focal point being Silent Hill Prison and the nearby Brookhaven Hospital in the great state of Stephen King's literary lust, Maine, on the shores of Toluca Lake. During this migration of imprisoned people, not so coincidentally, a second plague struck the newly titled town, putting the hospital to work for years to come. As history would move on, the prison would eventually shut down as the advent of a nearby coal field would lead to the town's revitalization. Shortly after the American Civil War's beginning, this led to the Toluca prison camp being built for POWs to be made in Silent Hill. The tallying of many tortured souls in the prison, as well as dead Native Americans, would rack up further as the battle at Wounded Knee would stop any Native American resistance that had been occurring till that point. The slaughter would eventually be forgotten in the tiny town in Maine as disappearances across Silent Hill were starting to begin. Prisons and mining efforts eventually shutting down in Silent Hill and needing a proper form of revenue, corrupt higher-ups decided to reinvent the city as a tourist attraction in order to lure people and tourists into their little town. Over the next century, many horrific and awful happenings occurred, from the sacrificing of four people each by their own individual families that created Shepherd's Glen nearby to appease God in 1903 and 1953 respectively, the tourist ship the Baroness going missing on Toluca Lake without a trace, and Helen Grady attempting to kill her son by flooding their home with gas. And back in 1911, miners would discover strange symbols in their caves that led to unexplained events that shut down these mining efforts. This would lead to fewer tourists coming to town due to increasing rumors. Over this half century, the briefly mentioned cult The Order would slowly build a following and power. While in their beginnings they were shunned by Silent Hill's general public, the Order would slowly infiltrate into seats of political and financial power in the town. It wasn't until the birth of one individual that these strange occurrences magnified beyond belief. The birth of Alessa Gillespie by the enigmatic Dahlia Gillespie. 
Dahlia had been an extremist follower of the Order and unquestionably followed every facet of this faith, from its dark magic and speaking in riddles. When she brought her daughter Alessa into the world, she would make sure her child would be indoctrinated in these teachings just as much as her, through any methods possible. In a physically abusive nature, Dahlia would leave her daughter battered and bruised for even slightly shying away from any doctrine that was an unbreakable concrete rule in her household. Beating her, locking her in the house's dark attic for hours or even days at a time, and severe mental berating. However, Alessa did not hold this abuse against her mother as she held dear to her heart the cult's central belief of what was called paradise. Paradise being a plane of existence brought about by this religion's deity, devoid of all evils brought by humanity, but only by giving birth to this god through a surrogate mother and wiping out humanity thereafter. Many of the aforementioned disappearances in Silent Hill were young women the cult abducted to use as surrogate mothers to attempt to birth their god to spur forth paradise, although each one was a failure. Alessa would devoutly follow God as her mother did, despite having a dark and beaten demeanor in public. Dahlia had intended to have Alessa follow in her footsteps, but came to the vile conclusion that since Alessa was born from the Order's very leader and high priestess, that her child would be the perfect candidate for a surrogate mother to the birth of their god. At the age of only seven, Dahlia set her daughter up in the second story of their home and proceeded to immolate her in fire to complete the necessary ritual. The flames spread throughout their home, causing a huge house fire that caught the attention of Travis Grady, who saved Alessa from the fire as Dahlia fled. Travis had passed out from smoke inhalation outside as we see Alessa is covered in fourth degree burns, head to toe, but her mother's plan was a success. This young child bore the embryonic god of the order within her, but the god would remain in a dormant state. During the fire-ridden ritual, Alessa let a portion of her soul escape. Through the events of Origins, Travis guides the astral projection of Alessa while her original body was taken to a ritual site within Dahlia's antique store and looked after by one Dr. Kaufman, director of the town hospital, where the body would be transported to in its basement. From there, they would torture Alessa's body to unlock latent reality-bending powers more and more. During that time, she split apart into a reincarnated baby that Harry would raise to become Heather, while the other half of her is put into a baby on the side of a road that is eventually found by Harry Mason and his wife, who named the abandoned child Cheryl. This torture would last for years as they would give her hallucinogenic drugs to amplify her tormented experience. Imagine tripping balls while you are tortured and mutilated. Dahlia was planning to reunite her daughter's soul by bringing Cheryl to the quiet town, but Alessa used her power to compel Cheryl to return so they may reunite and die to end this evil game. It was Cheryl's return that brought forth the fog and its preceding psychic abilities that blanketed Silent Hill. This is where the game truly takes off and where we will stop with the lore. But keep in mind, Alessa was not always the beacon of all of this chaos. As murderers like Walter Sullivan, who uses his victims as pawns in his evil game, like creating ghosts with unique powers to kill those who oppose him, and Claudia Wolf, who took the reins of these powers to attempt to wipe out humanity and create paradise as originally intended by Dahlia. By birthing a god through tribulation and woe in the supernatural pregnancy of Heather Mason, hastening God's birth. Although the terms of service with Walter were, were a lot different than getting impregnated as he had to perform the 21 sacraments for the descendant of the Holy Mother, which required murdering 21 separate people and literally cutting their hearts out in order to summon their God. And when he did kill those people, they would come back as horrible entities. But the main takeaway is the person that houses the god of the order will most likely stem forth the fog and other world that will create chaos. It's safe to say any town, even outside Silent Hill, could be enveloped by the effects of these psychic powers if put into our realm of reality, if they are resting on the grounds of the original source of the place of silent spirits. The manipulation and infiltration of public officials and government could see to covering up all these horrible instances that were instigated by Dahlia. Cue those conspiracy theories!
But if kept in isolation and allowed to let this child's body grow older and be tortured for destructive purposes, could result in worse and more expansive instances in larger cities and populated areas, bleeding over into neighboring settlements. Now what can come from these people as they are tortured and tormented to create this chaos? Well, the first of which, the fog world, is considered an unconscious realm or a dream reality state, where its namesake, the billowing white fog, descends on a normal setting, hindering the sight of all those who obviously enter. The fog being the representation of the clouded mind and memory of its creator. Buildings, establishments, roads, and physical reality itself will bend to its will to make a veritable labyrinth out of cityscapes, inexplicably shutting off entryways without any way of opening them, with some being locked with keys that are put into unconventional places like the inside of soda cans and vending machines, making for a maddening experience of trying to find your way to safety. Emerging from this fog are the various monsters created as physical embodiments of strong emotions of anger, sadness, stress, want, trauma, and more. This becomes dependent on the memories of the source person or projecting the mind of each individual person within its realm. A person's traumatic experiences with certain people, animals, imagination driven by reading books or watching movies, phobias of certain things can manifest as monsters in specific manners. Hence why we see rabid dogs attacking Harry or we get violent insect-like beasts that come by the thousands. The other realm that bends reality is the other world, considered a subconscious realm or REM sleep state, involving more dreaming with your body reacting more heavily, like rapid eye movement, increased pulse, and breathing. This is the border of reality and unreality, a cancer on the world that slowly decays it into hell on earth. But this realm also projects monsters and reality bending effects just as much as the fog world, but to a very much more hostile degree, creating more horrific settings of twisted, rusted metal, blood drenched in every corner with barbed wire, hanging chains, and oppressively claustrophobic flesh-ridden walls. This environment serves to magnify the fear of those who are trapped within. Fan speculation may consider the fog world just the real world but with added fog, but regardless, hostile beings appear and begin to hunt you down with your worst fears, insecurities, and more projected forth in one or more of people's own personal nightmares. For people dealing with mental disabilities or disorders, anyone with buried or apparent trauma, or overtly burdening fears and inner demons, which tends to be a wide portion of mankind, this is basically a death sentence. Facing your fears, your downfalls, your insecurities, the worst of your personality and mind has to offer. You will have to face those head on as these manifestations will be too much to handle as we are all not plot armored or main characters in the story of our own life that we eventually overcome our inner and outer obstacles, especially in a scenario where these negative mental aspects can literally come to kill us or make us completely insane Hell, we see it with Eddie Dombrowski, who descends into madness, creating an outward projection that leads him into a murderous rage against his own friend. Killing a person ain't no big deal. Just put the gun to their head. So, what will appear before you in either the fog or the gore-addled Otherworld? The monsters of Silent Hill are tailor-made to their characters, but you have to think, monsters of very different varieties not seen in the games or movies could generate in untold ways dependent on your mind and the minds of those around you. But for now, we will be going over what the franchise has provided over the years as monsters and what aspects of your mentality may spawn your means of demise. And what better way to start than with the icon himself, Pyramid Head born from unadulterated revenge to dish out punishment on humanity who has caused so much pain and suffering throughout the series, but also a person's hidden desire to be punished themselves for their transgressions can create Pyramid Head, a face hidden by a gigantic pyramid-shaped helmet to literally mask its own connection 
to humanity. It can brew from the guilt of even killing the monsters of these realms, as mankind tends to feel guilt to a certain degree for the act of murder, no matter who the victim or assailant is. It will also project other inner demons of a person that it stemmed from, like sexually abusing mannequins to dig deeper into their mental breakdown. It bears with it weapons called the Great Knife and Great Spear, both of which are used to easily mutilate others and chop them in half or into bits. Although Pyramid Head very slowly lumbers around, it is a very durable entity and, even if killed, can rematerialize itself if a person commits an act they consider unforgivable, like when James killed Eddie in self-defense. Now born from anxieties and fears predominantly within hospitals, the nurses, variations including puppet and bubblehead, can either be born from half meter long parasites penetrating your body and infecting it just like the medical staff into puppets or projecting the anxiousness regarding a diseased loved one and sexual frustration like it was done with the bubble head and its heavy ass cleavage. They will wobble about in a very unsettling, twitchy manner, wielding scalpels and long metal pipes. They tend to gather in large numbers but attack indiscriminately, often leading to harming each other rather than the victims they want to kill. Of course, the nurse isn't going to be alone as they sometimes are with their doctor and with the puppet doctor they act just like puppet nurses but are a bit slower and have a hell of a lot more growths and you know doctors are going to be slow just like when you're in a waiting room and you get there during your scheduled appointment and you still have to wait 30 minutes On a similar notion to sexual frustration, which would be a nightmare during No Fat November, or possibly forced sexual acts, comes the mannequins, as I mentioned earlier during Pyramid Head. Not literal mannequins, but a torso with four long, slender legs, standing completely still like statues blending into dark environments that become disturbed upon sudden sources of light, or if you get too close to them and be in their proximity, they will walk around like an insect and try to strike you like a praying mantis with a pair of legs that just don't quit. Just try to stay away from them. Spread across many installments of the franchise, the Creeper, oh man, yeah get that meme out of the way, is a giant cockroach obviously made by a fear of insects. They can swarm like a horde of locusts to eat at individuals by the hundreds or even thousands, meaning they can be easy enough to squish individually, but they will outnumber any efforts you make at fighting back. You can kill a few, but there's just going to be so many, a couple stomping's not going to work. Now by the film's standards, each insect is a captured memory of a Silent Hill victim, resembling their face on the mandible of their bodies. Swarms are very similar in nature to the creepers, but resemble it more of beetles rather than cockroaches with barbed legs so that they can latch onto victims more easily and making getting rid of them much more difficult as they slowly drain your blood. I mean, thousands of these bugs all over you draining you, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Trauma can reflect deeply and monstrously from even one's place of rest. The abstract daddy, a grotesque algamation of two humans entrapped in a blanket of human flesh upon a bed frame, seemingly stuck in the act of intercourse, insinuating the heinous act of, yet again, forced intercourse. On the bottom side of this bed frame is a slit with two mouths that the creature will try to force your head into to devour. Disguised as regular beds, it can easily take form amidst your sleep Sleep, or why you took shelter in a bedroom to corner you and easily snuff you out in this closed space. Dolls and even mascot costumes can decide to screw with you in a number of ways, most famously with Robbie the Rabbit, who will appear numerous times as you traverse your way through the other world or fog world. Its seemingly inanimate body can prop itself to look like a dead body or as a plush doll pointing at you on hotel beds. Or in the case of the arcade game, hordes of mascots wielding bladed weapons to chop you up like a more brutal version of Five Nights at Freddy's, but a lot less PewDiePie jump scares. <laughs> and less nuts, bolts, and unsold merch at GameStop, and a lot more fear-fueled nightmares. Stemmed from the notion of cancer running wild, the insane cancer is a hulking, decrepit, steroid version of the Demogorgon, covered in ooze, filled pustules, and bogged down by its sheer girth. Often blocking pathways or tight spaces, it will slowly waddle its way to you till it draws close and picks up its speed fast enough to crush you. They will be found lying around on the ground resting, regenerating any taken damage as cancer mostly tends to do after chemotherapy treatments. It could take multiple slugs from a shotgun and tons of damage till it dissipates, but is tough to take down. 
human-like creatures bound in their own design. Generated from personal suffering are the lying figure, the armless man, and straitjacket, all seemingly armless due to being restrained by their own flesh, apparel, or a cocoon-like growth over their figure. Lying figures can spew noxious gas clouds from their mouth, armless men can spew acidic toxins from their chest, and of course, straitjacket will latch onto your body with its legs, also spraying corrosive acid directly into your face. No matter what, despite not having arms, they're going to be more toxic than a Twitch chat when they get close to you. Sometimes dying to the fog or the controller of the fog can have you come back as a tormented soul, a human body torn, stretched, and mutilated to be suspended by itself in rusted cages, eternally suffering until someone puts them out of their misery. They can be used to stop the onslaught of the Relentless Void, which we will get into later. Pendulum summoning in the Pendulum, born from the drastic nature and mood swings that this environment forces your state of mind to go through, a slapped together combination of two human torsos connected by a metal circle and blades all over as it floats in the air. Being above your head, it will rotate the metal disc in the center to swing its blades in a pendulum fashion to slice through victims. Mandarins, looking like disfigured people with giant flesh lights for arms created from a sense of helplessness will keep themselves behind fences and grating to attack you from below while keeping itself mostly protected from any melee hits. It will latch onto the flooring and swing slowly to wherever you may roam. A more violent and numerous version of this creature is the Closer, this time born from suppressed memories of abuse. This creature had no intention of hiding, and its arms are now way more pronounced to the point of looking like punching bags tipped with a jagged bone to impale others. They are slow in their approach, but can be hellishly fast in swinging their big, meaty arms to crush your bones and stab your head with little hesitation. Hanging from above, stemmed from a horrible childhood, the Ariel, Ariel, however you want to pronounce it, acts like the Half-Life Barnacle, waiting for its prey to get underneath them to latch on prey, and instead of biting their head off, will choke them out. If you disconnect them from their hanging rope, they will begin to run around and try to kick you, but are pretty much as fragile as porcelain, so they are easy to disperse. However, they can be difficult in large numbers as they usually squat up in groups of three or more. Now you may find yourself trapped within buildings because of figures like the Glutton, who will close off exits and entries to prevent escape in a deadly scenario. This creature is invincible and immovable until it has read directly the story of Tufui Ego Edis, which will promptly cause it to disappear. But here's the thing. You have to find the time getting these pieces of literature all together while navigating a monster-filled domicile just to make this thing disappear. This could be too much, as you're wasting time as you slowly lose your sanity and stamina just to get the pages of this literature. Now the very walls around you could be home to hostile specimens like the wall man who can assimilate in a camouflage state into the fleshy walls of the other world in order to spring forth and attack unaware people. The very walls next to you could be home to a hostile entity, this one having enough strength to punch and swing your body like a ragdoll with little to no effort. And now out of the water comes either the fear of drowning or the trauma of a loved one suffering a similar fate. The lurkers, like a mutilated version of a mermaid with its legs sewn together and sickle-like weapons grafted onto their arms, topped off with a slit for a mouth filled with sharpened teeth. They will cram themselves in gutters and small places to ambush you at any moment and will not hesitate to rip you to shreds. Attempting to take the sewer route like most apocalyptic scenarios do to get to safety could be met with a watery grave as open bodies of this sludge could be home to sewer monsters. Real creative name, I know. They are created from possibly the fear of the unknown that deep bodies of water can create. They are long tentacle-like serpents that can and will shoot out from the murky depths to pull you into the water to suffocate you and your body to never be seen again. Unless you have a hair dryer or some kind of active electrical device handy to electrocute it before it can attack, but that would require prior knowledge that it even is there or that it exists and that you even have an electrical device that you can throw in. I mean, you can throw your phone once, but that doesn't mean you'll have another one available. Now, are you like me and had that nightmare of being chased by a T-Rex as a child because you watched way too much Jurassic Park? Well, that is how the Air Screamer was born since its creator regularly read The Lost World, giving this creature a pterodactyl-like shape 
and wings with human qualities. They are relatively weak, but their fast speed and maneuverability in the air could have you confused and swinging wildly as it slashes you down slowly. Honestly, I much prefer this incarnation over the fog or other world making something close to a T-Rex or a Velociraptor. I don't see anybody taking that on easily. Medieval medical procedure-wise, the Bloodsucker, a fusion of three giant leeches generated by a fear of long, slender, carnivorous animals. It hunts through the scent of blood and will not stop consuming dead flesh or drinking puddles of blood until it is satiated. Approaching it during its feast will make it switch its focus to attacking you. A giant leech that can drain your blood from three separate mouths would not take long to suck you dry. Screamers, because every horror scenario has to have a loudmouthed enemy, shrieks at high enough decibels to potentially deafen you and incapacitate you long enough so that it may slice you to bits with its wolverine-like claws made of rusty nails. And don't even get me started, if you were to get deafened in the middle of all this, all the fear that would stem from a whole sense being gone would create a litany of other monsters. Similar in loud nature, the slurpers can be a product of a deep hatred for children, as they whine and shriek a lot, but huddle together in a very intelligent manner to cram into crawl spaces and overwhelm victims. This gaggle of slurpers charge into people's legs to knock them to the ground in order to trample them to death and bite away at their flesh. Needlers, no no, the guns in Halo that suck are good, suck again, then became OP, but needlers who jaggedly walk around as an amalgamation of the pain of childbirth, seeing as its head is between its legs, with sharp pain distributing sickles as its appendages. They will cluster up in small spaces to ambush from just about anywhere, and can block incoming attacks and retreat when in danger. But of course, just looking at them, you can tell just one swipe from their scythes could have your sides splitting. Two backs are horrible looking things, like a mix of various dead corpses strewn together in one drape of skin, with syringe-like needles poking out from all around its frame. In no time flat, they will spew corrosive acid at you to stun you, put you down on the ground, pin you down, and inject you with their needles to administer acid directly into your body and then vomit more acid on your face. You're gonna just be a pile of acid by the time you're done encountering this creature. Now speaking of twins, twin victims being horrible conjoined pairs of infants born from being murder victims of a certain killer with long withered arms and pointing at people whispering receive of. They are passive unless approached wherein they will dash around the room rather fast and strike at you with their longer than normal arms. Weakening them enough will have them crying on the ground like an abandoned baby, striking at any human's natural sense to protect a crying infant, forcing many to reconsider taking them out completely. Doing so may give them the opportunity to recover and destroy destroy your moral consumed body. Gumheads, generated from a view of mankind as monsters or primitive beasts, often acting like primates. Switching between running on all fours or on their hind legs, they have brute strength that can be dangerous as they can wield any weapon they can find. Much like apes and monkeys, they will gather in groups, befriending each other and making their threat level much higher, seeing as how they can rip you limb from limb if caught off guard. Rompers are similar to this behavior, acting like full-on gorillas charging at you at full force, almost like Left 4 Dead's jockey and charger if they had a baby, laughing maniacally as it pins you down, possibly created by a fear of adult figures who overpower you to get their way. It can also run you over and gouge out your throat with its teeth, being heavily plated in hard flesh to be resistant to oncoming attacks. Bosses can also become a part of our split world, like the asphyxia, born from the torment of a loved one dying by suffocation with this human centipede of a woman, excluding feet. So sorry, Roanoke, you won't be starting with the feet on this creature. Hands cover her entire body, however, and attacks like a giant centipede would, looking to pull victims into a biological mass to abduct and torture them further. The amount of sheer force this giant body can put onto you can crush you, or she could just bitch slap you to death. Arachnophobia and guilt can be a mean mix, as the Amnion looks like a pregnant, three-breasted woman forced into a hybrid of a mechanical spider-like apparatus. She can use these legs to low sweep fast, to knock you flat on your ass, only to spew toxic bile to turn you into mulch for grass. That bile either direct or spraying above to make a small display of acid rain to corrode your flesh. Now the Split Head, the first boss in the franchise, resembles a giant lizard with a head that, 
well, splits widely open. It is extremely slow, but can open up its jaws wide enough to enclose its prey and ravel them in to its gaping maw. However, its mouth is its weakness, so it will at first try to headbutt you using its full mass to bowl you over. Now, the split worm is very similar in nature to this beast, but as a gigantic, thick-skinned worm burrowing around the ground beneath your feet, or around you, possibly causing tremors to make you fall over for an easier bite-sized snack. Its outer flesh is kind of like an armor for it, and if you're unlucky, you can be swallowed up in one gulp. The void is basically a black hole that will pursue you in any environment distorting the world around it, created from a fear of imprisonment, as it slowly pushes forward, can instantly obliterate your body if it catches up to you, and if close enough, will seemingly slow down time distort your perception of the world, and visually make your body look like it's being Thanos snapped. The only way of slowing down its pursuit is by knocking down the poor, caged, tormented souls we talked about earlier into its abyss for a short time. If you don't have enough stamina to outrun it, well, you're going to be eradicated from existence. Getting into position, the missionary is actually a product of the Order manipulating this power to directly control and order this deadly beast, born from the idea of impregnation and total faith. It can lash out with long blades that can deflect bullets with ease due to superhuman reflexes. The abusive father of Claudia Wolf was mutated by his daughter's twisted desire for genocide, making him an amphibious, rotted, tall figure with bone-bladed arms to gut you at will. He could stay underwater as long as he wants to ambush from the watery depths and stab at thee. Some traumas of seeing a loved one commit suicide right before your eyes can culminate into an entire room, becoming the flesh and body of a boss creature like the sad daddy. Tentacles will drape through the room to attempt to strangle you as it tries to blind you with gallons of sprayed blood, with a giant mouth full of teeth to chomp at you, only dying if three vital parts of its body are killed in enough time. Before a pyramid head was incepted into the universe, the butcher the embodiment of ruthless cruelty brought on by the Order will haphazardly use its giant cleaver to kill anything near it, even killing a nurse from the crotch up. Unlike many other fog monsters, the Butcher remains calm and collected, giving him a more focused string of slaughter to easily find you and cut you into bits. And of course, the very god that the Order and its insane followers had been attempting to embed in the womb of willing or unwilling participants, which Sorry for the small amount of ladies watching, but you also may have been killed before any of this even happened, becoming a sacrifice of somebody trying to put a god in your womb by putting you on fire. I mean, you're probably going to end up a charred corpse in these attempted rituals. But serving as a passive servant, Valtiel can be seen in many of the Order's sects, using its mere presence to guide followers further into their beliefs and manipulate their minds to follow all orders and even at times grant supernatural powers. It will stalk and watch over the woman that bears the prodigal child, waiting to see her possibly die so that it may drag her body to a discreet location in order to fully resurrect God. His sheer anonymous nature to serve the rebirth of its God could make for the catalyst of the worst case scenario in the franchise of this God fully returning and plunging the world into chaos. A small, almost successful attempt was made at the end of the first game, where Dahlia finally is able to reunite Cheryl Mason and Alessa, two halves of the same soul, as well as the dormant god, in order to merge the creation of the Incubator. This heavenly figure, glowing brighter than the sun, being protected in a veritable force field, immune to any direct combat as she fires scorching hot heavenly light at you. If you have no firearms or means of long-range combat, you will be doomed as you cannot fight back in any way. She can be killed with persistence, but if a substance known as Aglophotus, a red liquid capable of expelling evil demons, is found and coveted by someone like Dr. Kaufman, if this liquid makes contact with the incubator's flesh, the liquid will force out a demonic, Satan-like creature from the incubator's back called the Incubus, possibly symbolizing how these people can view this person as a god, but in reality is nothing more than an evil, satanic being. But when it does come out of her, because of the liquid and because it has not had time to fully grow, is a weakened, imperfect form of their god, reminiscent of Baphomet. It will fly about, striking reddened lightning at anyone, even killing Dahlia, 
who had done nothing more than tried to make this god come into existence. Being imperfect, this creature can be defeated and killed, and will return to separated forms of the original soul once it has been murdered. It's safe to say if this god were allowed to attain its perfect form, there wouldn't be a preteen hero to blast it away or a good guy or gal with a gun to shoot it down, leading to what the Order always wanted, paradise. Or, basically in reality, a horrific, bloodied world devoid of most forms of life. Human, animal, any kind of creature you can think of. Which, in retrospect, there can't be any violence if everything is already dead, right? So they're technically not wrong. Now, I'm sure you probably thought I left out the first enemy in the franchise. If you're a dog, mom, or dad, or an avid fan of Doge like me, well, that may come back to bite you. Dogs either spawned from these astral worlds or transformed regular canines into one of many beasts based on a fear of dogs, like the Groaner, a starved-looking large greyhound, who, through their desperation, will attempt to make you their next meal. Besides being what is basically a rabid mutt, it has a more dangerous counterpart in the Wormhead. The same dog, but with a tougher exterior, rotted flesh, and of course, having parasitic worms dominating its entire skull. Yet, its jaws are still very much ready to rip your flesh from bone. Now, you're probably thinking, why would I make the dogs the last enemy I would talk about? Who was the one controlling all of this from the beginning? Well, the one controlling it all, all the way from the start. Disregard everything I said about mental manipulation and the powers of offspring of the Order. Nobody I was talking about before, that's all fake news. The true enemy, the true god of diabolical creation in Silent Hill, behind it all, the entity that sparked the beginning of your end. <clears throat> it was... Me the whole time, baby! Oh my no, she was a totonaka. Oh my god! Well, that's a large bulk of enemies and abominations that could crop up dependent on your latent insecurities and fears. But like I said, these monstrosities are entirely dependent on the mental framework of you and those around you. So even with the pre-warning of everything I have discussed, there is no telling what may lie in wait as you approach Silent Hill or areas suffering from the same curse. As we discussed earlier, there's no telling if it was actually in the real world, if it might affect the town that you're in currently, or even a bigger landscape. I did miss out on a few creatures like the people that were in the prisons that were transformed, and I'm sure someone will mention that in the comments. But to not make this video drag on longer just because I'm throwing in every single enemy, I went over some of the stuff that would be a primary, recurring, or gigantic threat to your survival because of the mental aspects of those around you and yourself. Being able to come in and out of this alive would be much more than an achievement as it envelops the town you live in. Having to face your fears and overcome all negative aspects of your psyche is like facing a demonic therapist that knows everything about you and using it all against you, wearing you down mentally as armies of monsters use your weakness to devour you, rip you to shreds, or turn you into either a monster or a suffering soul doomed to writhe in agony. Now some of you say, well I'm pretty well armed, I've got the available weaponry and I know how to fight back against some of these guys. Well remember what I said, you're not going to know every single creature and taking them out will be a task in of itself because there's just such a large number of them. Most people will lack the physical and mental fortitude to even survive the initial onslaught of these mental demons. But if made widespread, even battle-hardened individuals devoid of plot armor would suffer similar fates as they possibly turn on each other, thinking everyone is against them or out to kill them. You could very easily not even be killed by a monster of the fog or other world, but a paranoid individual who is only looking to defend themselves in their panicked state. Or hell, you could become that scared person who dies trying to kill others because they think they're about to be killed by the people they know and love. Now I can't reiterate enough, and we'll say it one final time, but facing your inner demons as manifested monsters will ultimately lead to your downfall as you are trapped with an alternate reality with no hope of escape, as the Order also slowly looks to wipe out non-believers and resurrect their god. If successful, this god would slowly wipe out humanity in a global outbreak of the fog and other world. There are no characters that are directly connected that will probably kill this god in time. 
leaving nothing but a blood-soaked landscape behind as humanity slowly becomes extinct.